Hey everybody, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. We're constantly updating it with new content and never seen before content. So if you want to get the latest from Harvest, hit the subscribe button.
to the final night of the Southern California Harvest Crusade with Greg Laurie. Who's excited to be here tonight at the Big A? The Robertson clan. They turned duck calls <laughs> into a multi million dollar empire. But running a family business is tough when the family just wants to run wild. Boom, bow, bow. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> but I did. Boom, 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 boom. Find you a meek, gentle, kind spirited country girl. If she knows how to cook and she carries her Bible, and she loved to eat bullfrogs. Now there's a woman. See what I'm saying? So sweet, Phil, welcome. Hey, good to be in California. Man, you are like, you're a Cajun rock star here, Phil. <laughs> well, all I can tell you California folks, Jesus number one. So, <laughs> you know, Phil, I, we have a lot of Duck Dynasty fans here and we've watched your family on TV. We've gotten to know your family. Of course, there's Uncle Cy, your boys, Jace, Willie, and Jeff, and now Alan, who led us in prayer tonight as well, the clean-shaven Robertson. Yep. And uh, you know, it's an amazing thing. I think your season premiere had 11.8 million viewers, and the next show eclipsed that one. And you know, when have we had a show on television and had a positive uh, family to look at? And maybe in the old days, we had fictitious ones like you know, the Andy Griffith show or the Little House on the Prairie, but you're a real family. Why do you think Duck Dynasty has become so popular? I think finally America is beginning to look around and say, how much of this vile, evil, wicked stuff are we going to take? Let's get back to loving God and it's loving right. each other for crying out loud. Yeah. I think a lot of people will be surprised by your upbringing. I've been reading your book, Happy, Happy, Happy. Could you just say that one time for us? Everybody happy, happy, happy here tonight. <laughs> That's right. You talk about your upbringing in Louisiana. You were raised in the 50s, but in a way, it seemed more like the 1850s than the 1950s. It was hardcore, it was like a log cabin. You went out and hunted for food. That's how you survived, right? We had no bathtub, no hot water, unless you set the tub out in the yard and let the sun warm it up. <laughs> uh, we pretty well lived off the land. Times were hard, we were poor, but I never heard anyone say we were poor and we never called on the government to help us out. Yeah. That's good. So you met Miss K in high school. How old was Miss K when you met her? Miss K was 14. California, all you young bucks out there, are y'all listening? If you marry these girls at about 16, they'll pick your ducks. If you wait till they're 20, they'll pick your pocket. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> So you met in high school, you got married after you graduated, then you went to Louisiana Tech, you played football, and uh, you were the starting quarterback in your junior year, beating out a pretty well-known quarterback, Terry Bradshaw. Well, I weighed my options and someone said, well, why didn't you go ahead and play pro football since you played ahead of Bradshaw? But I weighed it and I said, let's see, how shall I make a living? Shall I make a living running from large, violent men or shall I go chase ducks? 
I thought it less stressful to chase ducks, California. Yeah. And you've got a lot of your duck calls here. You betcha. You, wait, show, tell us, a, in your book, you talk about the different sounds that different duck calls make. Give us a little demonstration. Well, you got a little teal here. That's a teal. Here's a mallard. What's that little orange one do? Oh, that's not there. This, oh, there it this is. This calls your dog air, a duck. <laughs> Fetch up. Give him a duck. Now, after you graduated from high school, you went and bought a honky tonk, and your life started going downhill. I think some pre people would be surprised to know you were into drug, sex, and rock and roll. You just did it all? I went from sex, drugs, and rock and roll until I was 28 years old. I heard the good news about Jesus when I was 28, and I decided to make a change in my life. And now I'm rich and famous. <laughs> that worked out pretty well. Hey, California. You know what Miss Kay told me the other day? She said, Phil, I've been poor with you, and I've been rich with you. Rich is better. Well, now, when you were kind of in the throes of drinking and getting in fights and all that, your wife, Miss Kay, showed up with a preacher. No, excuse me, I have that wrong. Your sister showed up with a preacher. And so this preacher is trying to convert old Phil Robertson. How'd that go? I basically ran him off at the time, and uh, he remarked that he didn't think I was ready at the time. My little sister was handing out tracks up in the front where the, yeah. where the bar was. Right. And she got into a little row with the people there. They were about half drunk. But the bottom line is I ran him off. About a year later, I sat down and listened to what he had to say. And he preached to me, Greg, what you're going to preach tonight to these folks in California. That's right. And my life, my life has changed forever. Best thing that ever happened to me. That's right. Absolutely. So, Phil, you... You spent the first 27 years of your life without God. You finally responded to the gospel, and now you're going to go back and raise your boys in the way of the Lord, and you did a great job of that. But, you know, even when we train our children in the way that they should go, they can still go astray. And your oldest son, Alan, who led us in prayer, was he the first of your two sons to go prodigal? That is correct. In other words, all of you who have children, just remember... When we come out of our mother's wombs, we don't have any sin because we don't know what sin is. You're too little. You're a baby. But when we get in junior high, going into high school, along in there, all you parents should know your children are going to sin. They're going to make mistakes. What you have to do, parents, is teach them, train them, and above all, love them and discipline them. It will save you a lot of grief yeah. down the road. Even when you do that, they are going to sin. And my son, Alan, ended up in New Orleans, got in a scrape with a guy who liked to beat him half to death with a tire tool. And he decided, because a police officer came up there and said, son, you ought to go home back to your mama and daddy. So when he came back, we did like Luke 15. I said, come on back, Al. Let's have a good meal here. We love you. And later on, he turned out to be a preacher of the gospel. So that's the way it works. Oh, praise God for that. So your youngest son, Jeff, he got into drugs and drinking. Uh, I think uh, your, another of your sons, Willie, uh, was a youth leader. And he was telling you, I think, that Jep was showing up at church with whiskey on his breath and sort of living that double life. And Willie was so concerned, he, he wanted to stage a family intervention. I think Alan put that together. So what happened to Jep? And tell us about that family intervention. We had a Robertson family intervention, unbeknown to Jephthah, the youngest one. He didn't know this was going to happen. We got him down to my house and all of his brothers... And Miss Kay and I, we sat down with him, and we had us one of them come to Jesus meetings, and we let him know we loved him, 
and we let him know that uh, we were concerned for him. And he cried and he said, Dad, what took you and Mom so long to rescue me from what I was doing? And I told him, I said, Jeff, we were just giving you time to see the error of your ways. So I put him under house arrest for three months. <laughs> and after three months, he came out on the other side. And now he has Jessica, the one you see on television, four great little kids, three, three girls and a boy. And all of my sons are godly and their daughter-in-laws and everybody happy, happy, happy. <laughs> yes, that's right. You got to be patient, California. Yeah. Now, Phil, there's some people here that are in the same boat Jep and Allen were in, and they need to be rescued tonight. That message of the gospel changed your life. Why should someone who's here tonight, maybe they're here because they like your TV show. Maybe they were drugged by a friend. Whatever it is that got them here, they're not a Christian yet. They're checking it out. They're thinking about it. Why should they put their faith in Jesus Christ like you did? Listen, California, you have two problems that you cannot fix. You cannot solve it. One of them is sin, and we all sin. And the second one is physical death, heart attack, gunshot, car wreck. We all are going to die. All of us are going six feet deep. Listen. What God has done through Jesus, you're counting time by him. It's 2013 years since Jesus got here. What did he do? Died on a cross to remove your sin. First problem solved. Three days later, he was resurrected from the dead. The only way you're going to get off planet Earth is through Jesus. Period. That's right. Well, Phil? need to move on that tonight. That's right. We're going to give them that opportunity. And at the end of your program, I love the way that you always have a prayer. And you all pray together. And I think, wouldn't you all like to have Phil lead us in a prayer right now? So, Phil, pray for us tonight. I pray for each one here. I pray, Father that you will open their hearts to the gospel. Father, we have made a mess out of the United States of America. We're in debt up to our eyeballs and we're running around killing each other, kidnapping and killing our own children. We're slaughtering ourselves. Father, I pray that here tonight for all the ones who have not come to Jesus, I pray, Father, that they put the faith in what Jesus did on a cross 2,000 years ago so that all of their sins, every rotten, filthy thing they've ever done would be removed. And on top of that, Father, understand and know that one day when all this ends, their dead, cold body can be raised from the dead and they can live forever. Father, I'm looking forward to the day when all I do is chase ducks in heaven and there ain't a game warden anywhere. Thank you, Father, for giving us a great hope to live beyond the grave. And above that, Father, thank you for giving us all peace of mind when we come to Jesus with the help of your spirit you give us. I pray for these California folks, Father. Be with them. I love them, and I know you love them, Father. You've proven that by sending Jesus. And it's through him I pray for everyone here. Amen. Thank you, Phil Robertson. God bless you, man. Isn't that great? I'll tell you what. He's a lot of fun. Born in 1952 in Long Beach, California, my mother was stunningly beautiful. She was a dead ringer for Marilyn Monroe. 
but she seemed to be trying to find her purpose in life in a relationship with a man. She was married and divorced seven times and had a lot of boyfriends in between. My mom also was a raging alcoholic. And when I say an alcoholic, I'm talking about full-blown, passed out, drunk, pretty much every night. So I had to grow up quickly because I, in some ways, had to be a parent to my own mother. It got me searching for answers at a very early point of my childhood. I don't remember a lot of what was said that day, but a guy got up and spoke and he made this statement. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. I looked around at the other Christians and I thought, well, I'm not one of them. Does that mean that I'm against him? I've always believed in God. Whenever I was in trouble, I called out to Jesus. I'd seen all of his movies, but I never knew that Jesus could be known in a personal way. That was the day Jesus Christ came into my life, 1970. The last thing I ever planned on becoming was a preacher. Trust me when I tell you that. But because God became real to me, I wanted to share that with others. People who are cynical like I was, people who maybe were raised in broken homes like I was, people who've been chewed up and spit out by this world like I was. If God can use someone like me, he can use anyone. It's the message that's important. My wife, Kathy, is my best friend in life. She's my number one counselor. I grow in my love for her really every day. We've been married 39 years. We have two sons, one's on earth and one is in heaven, and we have five beautiful grandchildren. Well, for my downtime, I like to ride my Harley. I surf when the water is above 70 degrees. There's no one out competing for waves, and I'm in the mood, which means rarely. But honestly, one of the things I love to do more than anything else, just hang out with my family and play with my grandkids. Sometimes I think we think of life like a movie. You know, maybe it's a tragic story, but we'll say it's just a movie and the credits roll and we leave the theater. But sometimes tragedy happens in our lives, in real time, and it certainly happened to us when our oldest son, Christopher, died in an automobile accident on July 24, 2008. Pain knocks at every door. And just because I'm a preacher, it doesn't mean that I get a free pass. In the midst of this tragedy, we have found hope. What is hope? One way to define it is in an acronym, H-O-P-E, holding on with patient expectation. I have hope that I will see my son again in heaven. And that is why I want to give this message to others, because I believe there is hope in this hopeless world, and people need to hear it. You know, it's been said, if you preach to hurting people, you'll never lack for an audience. I think there's a lot of hurting people that need a message of hope today. All right. Wow. What a great night it's been so far. Now I want to talk to you about your soul. I want to talk to you about the meaning of your life. So I'm going to ask you to just listen really carefully because honestly, your eternal destiny is hanging in the balance of what we're talking about. The message I'm sharing is not original to me. I'm just a delivery boy. You know, years ago I used to deliver newspapers as a kid, not from a car, but from my super cool Stingray bicycle with even a stick shift on it. It was sort of a forerunner of my Harley. I had my bags on there and I'd throw editions of the Daily Pilot newspaper as close to the front door as I could get of the person that was on my delivery route. I was just a delivery boy. My job was not to make the news. My job was not to write the news. My job was to deliver the news. And that's what I am really still. I'm just a delivery boy. I'm just delivering a message from God to you. You might say, well, Greg, that's pretty presumptuous, isn't it? No, not at all. I, I want to tell you what the Bible says about your soul, about the meaning of your life, and how to get right with God. Let's pray for a moment. Now, Lord, I pray that you will speak to every person here. 
And I pray for those that have come who have never made this commitment to you. Help them to see their need for Jesus. Help them to believe in Jesus. Before this night is over, we ask it in your name, amen. The title of my message is God in Pursuit. Years ago we were doing one of our crusades and we were staying in a hotel and my son Jonathan was very little. I think he was around three or four years old. So he loved to push the buttons on the elevator. He'd always run ahead of me and push the right button. And so we're walking down a hallway of a hotel and he ran ahead to the elevator. I said, now Jonathan, wait for dad. I'm almost there. I turned the corner to see the doors of the elevator close with Jonathan alone. I Panic. I pushed every one of those buttons, pushing, pushing, pushing. Finally the doors open. No, Jonathan. I go down to the bottom floor, go up to the front desk of the lobby. I said, ma'am, uh, my son is lost somewhere in this hotel. Please call security, call SWAT, call the Green Berets, call the Navy SEALs. You gotta help me find my son. She's like on the phone. I'm sorry, sir. Just, I'm just like, I've got to find him. So I run back. I push every button of every floor. And when the doors open, I yell out his name. Finally, I found him, I don't know, five floors up. He's just standing there, you know. Jonathan, listen to dad. Don't run off. I was in pursuit of my son. And I want to tell you something. Failure was not an option. Listen to this. God is pursuing you. But wait. He wants to pursue you to show you how much He loves you. Some of us have this concept of God who's chasing us down because He wants to give us some kind of a beating. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus told a story to show us what God is like. Uh, Phil alluded to it a few moments ago. We call it the parable of the prodigal son. What is God like? He's like a father who lost his son. God is like a father who misses his son. God is like a father who longs for his son's return. And God is like a father who when his son returns runs to him and throws his arms around him and kisses him. God loves you. And God will forgive you of any sin you have ever committed. God is pursuing you tonight. Stop running from him. I heard the story of a lawyer who was trying to deliver an important paper to a man who was determined to avoid him at all costs. You see, this man thought the attorney was trying to serve him with a subpoena. So this guy managed to avoid that lawyer for years. <laughs> 14 years passed and this man the lawyer was pursuing was in a hospital dying of cancer. And they rolled that lawyer up right next to him in another bed. He was ill as well. The man looked at that lawyer that had been pursuing him and he laughed and he said, all right, go ahead, subpoena me. The lawyer said, subpoena you? I was trying to give you a document that proved you had inherited $45 million. See, that's us running from God. I want to tell you a story tonight about a man who tried to run from God. His name was Jonah. Now when you talk about Jonah, what comes to mind? Jonah and the? That's right. We all think of that whale. And because of that, we may dismiss this story as a fairy tale or a myth, but listen, it's a true story. Uh, it was validated by no one less than Jesus Christ himself who said as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish or the whale, the Bible doesn't say it was a whale, the great fish. Actually the technical translation would be a sea monster or uh, whatever that beast was. As Jonah was in the belly of that great fish three days and three nights, so will I, the Son of Man, be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So Jesus validated it. Heard a story about a young girl who was out sharing her faith on a street corner. A little crowd gathered and uh, a man was standing in the back who was an atheist and he thought he was going to humiliate this young girl. So while she's talking about her faith in Jesus, he interrupts and says very loudly, excuse me young lady, I have a question. She said, yes sir. Uh, you stand there and you talk about the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? Oh yes sir. She said, I believe the Bible. Every word of it is true. Oh you do, said the atheist then you must believe 
and the stories that are in the Bible. Oh yes, I believe all those stories. Oh really? So do you believe in the story of Jonah being swallowed by a whale? She says, well yes sir, I, I believe that story. The Bible teaches he was swallowed by a great fish or maybe a whale. Oh well, let me ask you, how is that even possible? She said, well I don't know. When I get to heaven, I'll ask him. Then the atheist said, well what if he's in hell? She said, well then I guess you could ask him. I don't know. <laughs> so God used this big old fish to swallow Jonah. How many animal lovers do we have out there? If you're an animal lover, raise your hand. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of animal lovers out there. How many animal haters do we have? Oh, I hope we don't have many. You know, it's funny, when I was a kid I had two aspirations. I wanted to either be a professional cartoonist or I wanted to own a pet shop. That was sort of my fallback plan. I, I have always loved animals ever since I've been a little kid. Started with my collecting of reptiles. I had every kind of reptile imaginable. In fact, I was so into reptiles I actually thought about becoming a herpetologist. Uh, that is uh, defined as a nerd. No, not really. It's someone who studies reptiles. I had lizards and I had uh, snakes. I had all kinds of snakes. I had pythons and I had boas and I had gopher snakes and king snakes and you name it, I had it. Then I went into my rabbit phase. I had rabbits, guinea pigs, mice, rats, hamsters. Then I went into my bird phase. I had finches, parakeets, cockatiels, lovebirds, and a parrot. Then I went to my dog phase. I had a couple of poodles. I was too young to know what I was doing. They were given to me. Sorry. Uh, I had a collie, one of the dumbest animals that ever lived. He was the opposite of Lassie. I had a Springer Spaniel, two German Shepherds, one of, me, one of them the greatest German Shepherd of all time, and a few mutts. Then I went through my fish bays. I had angelfish and Oscars and silver dollars, but I never had a cat. Never. Because why would you have a cat? I mean, really. I mean, when you call a cat, does the cat come? You call a dog, here boy, he comes running up, looks you, call a cat, cat looks at you like, do you seriously think I'm coming to you? You're joking, right? I've had all these animals, and I might add, I've been bitten by many animals. I've been bitten by parrots, rabbits, hamsters. I've been bitten by many snakes. I was even bit by a monkey once. A little spider monkey. Belonged to a friend of mine. I reached down to pet him on the head. That was a big mistake. A little monkey clenched onto my finger. I pulled my hand back in pain. He's hanging on my finger. Blood squirting out everywhere. Not a good thing. I'm looking forward to the day when Christ comes back and establishes his kingdom. And the Bible says the animal kingdom will be subdued. The wolf will romp with the lamb. The leopard will sleep with a kid. A uh, calf and lion will eat from the same trough and a little child will lead them. I've even read stories about how animals save people's lives. I read about a dog that dialed 911 when its owner fell ill. That's amazing. Apparently the owner taught his dog Bell to bite his cell phone if he had a diabetic seizure, which the dog did. Another man I read about was saved by his dog when his SUV plunged 40 feet. He was backing out too far from his driveway. He told his dog named Honey, go get help. The dog ran half a mile to a friend's house and brought them back. Maybe that's why dogs are getting their own TV network now. Have you heard about this? I'm not making this up. There's a whole channel now dedicated to dogs. It's programming geared toward dogs. I'm kind of wondering what that would be exactly. You know, close-up shots of fire hydrants, toilets, I don't know. But it keeps the attention of a dog. There'll never be one for cats, of course. Do you think a cat would watch it? But here's my point. These animals are so amazing and God used this creature to swallow the man that tried to run from the Lord. It doesn't matter if there was a fish in existence now like this fish that existed then. All we had to know is it existed once. But it's a man running from God. 
Here's what it says, Jonah 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But listen to this. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare and went down to it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Have you ever tried to run from God? Maybe you thought God was out to ruin all of your fun. Uh, God was out to mess your life up. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible tells us that God is good. The Bible says, give thanks to the Lord for He is good and His mercy endures forever. And God's plans for you are better than your plans for yourself. He says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. In other words, Jesus is saying, I came that you might live a life that is full and rich and meaningful. Meanwhile, the devil, and oh yes, there's a devil. As surely as there is a God who loves you, there's a devil who hates you. The devil wants to destroy your life. Jesus said of Satan, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to give life because God is good. But sometimes we run from God. We don't understand God. Uh, our granddaughters have a little rabbit named Fuzzy. And every now and then they'll pull them out, pull him out, Fuzzy. And uh, my, uh, one of my granddaughters, little Allie, Alexandra is her full name, will play with Fuzzy. Now she's only two, so sometimes she doesn't hold Fuzzy the right way. Sometimes she kind of picks him up by the head, you see? And Fuzzy's like, oh no, no, you know? And so, no, Allie, you gotta support him when you hold him. And, and so the other day when I was returning Fuzzy to his cage, he leapt out of my arms into the open cage. I'm so happy to be home. And that's how some Sometimes we see God, oh, it's, it's like a cage uh, with the bars. Well, look, that's one way to look at it. Bars keeping you in. I think Fuzzy the Rabbit says those are the bars that keep Allie out. I'm safe here. Listen, following Jesus Christ, I'm not gonna lie to you. There are things the Bible tells us we should not do. There are commandments that are put there for our own good, not to keep you pinned in, but to keep evil out of your life. And God won't hold it away from you if it's a good thing. The Bible says no good thing will he withhold from those that walk up rightly. Not only is God good, but God is love. You see, these Ninevites, these people Jonah was called to, they were wicked. That's why Jonah didn't want to go. He was a patriotic Israelite. It'd be like God coming to an Israeli today and saying, go to Iran, that great city, and preach to them. Well, maybe he wouldn't want to do that. See, Jonah's fear, and it was effectively justified, was that God would forgive Nineveh, and his hope was God would judge Nineveh and destroy them, and that would be one less enemy Israel had to worry about, so he didn't want to go. So God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah's response is, God, they drink haterade in Nineveh. I don't want to go. God said, go. Jonah said, no. God said, oh. Listen, the Lord will always have the last word. But yet, despite the wickedness of these people, God loved them. And graphic accounts are in historical records of the cruel treatment of captives from the Ninevites. They would burn boys and girls alive. They would torture adults. They would tear the skin from their bodies and leave them to die in the scorching sun. Yet amazingly, God loved these people and was giving them a second chance. And I want you to know that God loves you. And no matter what sin you've committed, He'll forgive you, but you need to turn from that sin. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that just like 5,756 people have done over the last two nights filling the field behind the stage. You can make that commitment to follow Christ. So Jonah got up and went in the wrong direction. And he went down. 
And that's where sin's always gonna take you down. We don't plan on going down, but one thing leads to another, doesn't it? That flirtation that ruined the marriage, that pregnancy that altered your life, that pleasure that turned into an addiction. Think about these things, especially you that are young. The evening of your life is determined by the morning of it, the end from the beginning. These things that you don't think are a problem now turn into big things. Have you ever seen a little baby rattlesnake? They're actually kind of cute in a weird way. Everything's miniaturized. They've got their little fangs and they've got their little rattler. And you might say, look at the little baby rattlesnake. And you pick it up and hold it up and he bites you. The little baby rattler feeling lightheaded. Ah, gosh. Drop for drop the venom of a baby rattler. It's super potent. And we'll take a sin and we'll say, oh, it's just a little sin. It's just one time. I'll never do it again. And little things turn into big things. And that's what happened to Jonah. I read about a rapper that had a number one hit. And he was talking in an interview about the effect of instant fame. His shows got bigger, his partying became more extreme. He says, I got more messed up than ever. All of a sudden, he says, you're young, you have this newfound attention. I was hooking up with random females and the drugs started getting stronger. I always said, I'll never do coke, but I broke that. I started doing a little bit of Oxycontin. That scared me. His friends began to worry because he didn't respond to texts and calls. They thought, oh, he's just too cool for us now. But the rapper says, I was alone, smoking in my bedroom. That's sin, man. It just takes you down. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to spend. Don't go that way. So a storm comes. A big old gnarly storm. And this was so hardcore, this storm, that even the sailors started to panic. And they were used to rough seas. They'd never seen anything like it. In a way, this was a loving storm. Because God was allowing it to get Jonah's attention. Maybe you've had a crisis in your life recently. Maybe you had a close brush with death. You got a scary call from the doctor about the tests that they just did on you. Or something has happened to remind you of your mortality. C.S. Lewis said, quote, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our consciences, but he shouts in our pain. Pain is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Sometimes God can take pain, or a storm if you will, to get our attention and show us we need God. Actor Gerard Butler, who starred in 300 and also uh, Olympus has fallen, had a close brush with death recently. He was learning how to surf big waves and prep for his film, Chasing Mavericks. He got hammered by a wave and he was pinned underwater for nearly a minute. Now, Butler is not a seasoned surfer. Uh, he was panicking, he thought he was going to drown. Uh, fortunately, rescuers got to him and they told him the last guy that went down at Mavericks had drowned, so he was fortunate to be alive and Butler says, and in a quote, you know how people say when you're close to death you get a sense of peace? Well, I didn't experience it. It was violent and it went on and on. It was absolutely terrifying, end quote. Yeah, that, that could happen and maybe that's happened to you. Well, these sailors are freaking out and they're calling out to their gods. None of them had the right God. I think a lot of times when we're in trouble, we'll, we'll call out to God. I'll tell you, I used to. Uh, one day when I was a kid, probably around 16 years old, I was with some buddies. Uh, we went down and bought a kilo of marijuana. Not to sell, we were gonna smoke it all ourselves. We put it in the trunk of our car. We're cruising down Pacific Coast Highway in Laguna Beach. And it was raining that night when one of my friends was driving. Suddenly the car starts to fishtail. And I'm in the back seat and I'm seeing the headlines in the morning newspaper, drug dealers die on Pacific Coast Highway. And I said, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll serve you. Suddenly the car corrected itself and we got home safely. And I said, thanks God, see you next crisis. You ever done that before? Oh God, if you get me out of this one, I promise I'll follow you. And he does. 
and you forget your promise. That's what these men were doing. They were crying out to their gods but none of them had the right God. So they cast lots. Uh, they figure out the culprit is this stranger who's on the bottom deck sleeping. They wake him up. It's Jonah. They're saying, what's going on with you? We figured out this storm came because of you. Jonah said, well, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the land. They're blown away. They had heard of the God of Israel, the God who parts oceans, the God who sends food from heaven, the God who raises the dead. And they're saying to him, you're running from a God like that? Nothing is more pathetic than being busted by a non-Christian, especially when they're right. You ever had that happen? A non-Christian says, I thought you were a Christian. Well, I am. Then why are you doing that? Well, good question. <laughs> that happened to me years ago. I had uh, become a Christian and I'd started a church and I had real long hair and a beard, Duck Dynasty style. And uh, I was sitting in a pizza restaurant and I looked over at the table next to me and there's this guy I recognized from uh, elementary school. His name was Paul. I said, excuse me, is your name Paul? He said, yes it is. You know how some people don't change, they just get like bigger, you know? He just looked like himself still. I look very different. I said, Paul, it's Greg Laurie. He goes, man, I didn't recognize you under all that hair. Use your imagination. I said, well, Paul, how you been? He, he says, I've been good. How about you? And I said, well, I, I've been good. I've changed a lot, Paul. You see, I've become a Christian. And not only am I a Christian, Paul, but I'm the pastor of a church. He looked at me like I was crazy. He said, Greg, you always used to get in trouble. You were always smart enough to the teacher. You're always doing pranks to other people. I can't believe you're a Christian. Oh, yes, I am. I'm serving the Lord. Hallelujah. He goes, okay, that's great, Greg. Well, thank you, Paul. Good to talk to you. I was feeling so good about myself. Well, we're waiting for our pizza to come and it finally arrives. Well, I was with a friend who went to the restroom for a moment. I forgot all about Paul and I thought it would really be funny to take the red pepper flakes and pour them on my friend's side of the pizza so when he took his first bite it would be really hot. So I'm laughing, pouring the red pepper flakes on his side of the pizza and Paul says, haven't changed much, have you, Greg? <laughs> He's kind of right about that. Sometimes we're like Jonah, we blow it. We've lost our testimony. <laughs> we're not being the representative of Jesus we ought to be. Let me just say something. If you're looking for a hypocrite free church, please don't join it, you'll ruin it. Okay? Every Christian is gonna be inconsistent at times. So let me apologize for us if we've not been the best representatives of Jesus Christ. But check this out. Jesus did not say, follow my people. He said, follow me. Jesus will never be a hypocrite. You follow him. Honestly, the whole there's too many hypocrites in the church line is nothing more than a shallow excuse. Why would you run from a God like this? They ask him. Sometimes non-believers have a better idea of what believers should do than some believers have. I read a true story about a bar that was being built in Texas. A local church started a campaign with petitions and prayers to stop it. Work progressed in this bar until a week before opening and lightning struck and burned the bar down. The bar owner sued the church saying they were responsible because of their prayers. The church denied any responsibility and there was no connection, they said, between our prayers and the fire. It went to court. The judge read the plaintiff's complaint and the defendant's reply. He said, I don't know how I'm going to decide this, but it appears from the paperwork we have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer and an entire church congregation that does not. That's interesting. So these non-believing men are saying to Jonah, why would you run from a God like that? That's a good question. Why are you running from God? He just wants to love you. He just wants to forgive you. And so the Lord had a custom made watercraft to take care of this problem. Jonah said, you throw me over the side of this boat, 
the storm will stop. And they did. And he was swallowed by this great fish. And now inside of the fish he stubbornly refuses to pray. Why did God do this? Because Jonah was a prodigal son. And God loves his kids so much he's not going to let them go. It's like my son Jonathan. I was going to find my son. It was like Phil Robertson told us about his son Alan and his son Jeff. He loved his sons. And his son Jeff said, Dad, I was waiting for you to rescue me. And that comes back to that picture of God who loves you and misses you. And I wonder if we have any prodigals here tonight. What is a prodigal? It's someone that knows what is right and does not do it. Maybe you were raised in the church. Maybe you've been living a double life. You've been putting on quite a performance. Everyone thinks you're a strong Christian, but you know what's up. You know what you're really doing. Listen, you can fool all of the people some of the time. You can fool some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool God any of the time. Prodigal, it's time for you to come home tonight to return to the Lord. That's why I'm gonna ask you in just a few moments to get up out of your seat and walk down here and stand in this backfield and make that recommitment to Christ or maybe that first time commitment to Jesus. So now the Lord gives Jonah a second chance. Jonah 3 says the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Deliver the message of judgment I've given you. This time the Lord, or Jonah, obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. He entered the city. He shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now and Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message and from the greatest to the least they decided to go without food and wear sackcloth to show their sorrow. I love how that says the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I have good news for you tonight, folks. God gives second chances. And he gives third chances. And he gives fourth chances. And as many as you need. Jonah said, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Well, that's not a very hopeful message, is it? Well, in a way it is. Because he was giving them a warning. Sort of like a parent warning their child. You do that one more time. There's gonna be a punishment. Okay, I'm warning you one last time. And then there's a punishment. Now if you're a grandparent, you say, if you do that again, there's a punishment. Then they do it again. If you do it again, there's a punishment. They do it again. You just keep saying it because basically grandparents don't punish their grandchildren. We let the parents do that. We just fill them full of sugar and give them back to you. That's our job to spoil our grandchildren. But you see, sometimes we don't listen to what God says. But God was giving to them another chance. I believe God wants the United States of America to turn back to Him. I believe the only hope for our great country is to turn back to God and turn from our sin. We need a spiritual awakening in America. Again, we've had four great awakenings. We're due for another. I tremble to think what will happen in our country if God does not send a spiritual revival. Let's pray for that. This is one of the reasons we're doing this event we call Harvest America, September 28 and 29 in Philadelphia. That's basically a month from today. So you can tune this thing in. You can pull it down to your computer, to your tablet device, to your smartphone, and you can watch it. You can watch it in your front room. You can have it in your church. You can have it in a the theater. But I hope that you'll all pull down that signal that we send from Philadelphia, once our nation's capital, as we proclaim the gospel. It's the only hope for America today. God was warning Nineveh, and God is warning America. He's saying, turn back to me now. That's his message. Listen, I'm no prophet, and I've never been swallowed by a fish, though I've swallowed a few fish called sushi. But I have a message, and here it is. There's only one hope in this life that can turn it around. There's only one lifeline that God has dropped from heaven for us to be forgiven of our sins. It's His Son, Jesus Christ, 
who was born in that manger and died on the cross and rose again from the dead three days later, who now stands at the door of your life and knocks. And if you'll hear his voice and open the door, he'll come in. Jesus said it best right in the front of this platform. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. That's your answer. That's your hope. It's your only hope. So I have a message of good news. But maybe I need to give you the bad news first. The bad news is, is every one of us have sinned. The bad news, every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. You say, no, Greg, I don't really think that I'm a sinner. I think I'm a good person. Have you ever read the Ten Commandments? God says, you shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall have no other gods before me. Have you ever had another God before the true God? Have you ever lied? Have you ever said, no, I haven't. You're lying right now. You've broken those commandments. You say, well, okay, I've broken a few, but some have broken more than me. Okay, true. But one of those commandments being broken is enough to keep you out of heaven. The Bible says if you offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. We're guilty. That's the bad news. The good news is Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sin. The good news is Jesus absorbed the wrath of God the Father that should have come upon me. Jesus Christ came to pay a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. And if you'll believe in him and turn from your sin, you can be forgiven. And you can have a second chance tonight. And I'm gonna give you that opportunity in just a moment. So check it out. The people of Nineveh turned to God. This is one of the greatest revivals in human history. If Nineveh could turn around, certainly the United States can turn around. And I hope that we will. But let's start with you tonight. Maybe you've been running from God. It's time to throw on the brakes, friend. It's time to come back to the God who loves you. It's time to come back home again. I told you that story already of that prodigal son that ran away, but Jesus said when he was still a great ways off, his father saw him and ran to him. I love the picture of the father running. You know, it was considered undignified in that culture for an older man to run. Not to mention it's just hard for an older man to run. I know this from experience. I've tried running. I've had my friends who run say, Greg, just hang in there and the endorphins will be released and you'll get the runner's high. I have never had a single endorphin released. I've never had this runner's high. I just have runner's pain. But that older man, that father, willing to lose his dignity, if you will, ran to his son and threw his arms around him. And that's what God will do for you tonight as you come to Him, or as you come back to Him. So what do you need to do to get right with God? Well, number one, you need to admit you're a sinner. I've already pointed out, all of us have broken God's commandments. All of us have fallen short of God's standards. But number two, recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Yes, it's true. Jesus died for the whole world. Jesus said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He died for the world, but listen, he died for you. I love the way the apostle Paul personalized it when he said, he loved me, and he gave himself for me, and Jesus loves you, and he gave himself for you. He died there in your place. Number three, you need to turn from your sin. The Bible uses the word repent. You say, well, I haven't even pented yet. Why should I repent? Listen, repent means to change your direction. Instead of running from God, you need to run to God. To repent is to acknowledge that the things you're doing are wrong before the Lord. There are sins before God and being sorry enough to stop those things and turn to Him and He'll give you the strength to live the life He has called you to live. But then you must receive Jesus Christ into your life. Being a Christian is about a relationship. 
You know, I think there's a lot of people that know a lot about God, but they don't know God. You know, I knew a lot about Phil Robertson before I met him. I watched his show, I read his book, but it was really a lot different in the back there meeting Phil in person. Now I have a different sense of who he is. He's really the same guy, but I sort of know him a little bit now, you see, and we all do after listening to him. But we know about people. We see him from a distance. No, being a Christian is having Christ come and live inside of your heart. You'll never be alone again. He'll take residence inside of you and give you the strength to be the person he has called you to be. You need to receive Jesus. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. Now if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. He'll come into your life tonight. But listen, you have to invite him in. He doesn't say, behold, I stand at the door and knock and if you don't open it, I'll kick it in because I'm God and you're not. No, he's the God who is pursuing us, but he will not force his way into our life. You have to, in effect, open that door through prayer and say, all right, Lord, come in. Then you must do it publicly. That's what thousands of people have already done this weekend. Thousands and thousands more have done it over the last 24 years. We've been holding these Harvest Crusades here at Angel Stadium. Jesus said, if you will acknowledge me before people, I'll acknowledge you before my Father and the angels in heaven. But he added, if you deny me before people, I'll deny you before the Father and the angels. That's why I'm gonna ask you to make a public stand in just a few moments. And finally, you must do it now. Do it now. Don't procrastinate. Don't put it off until tomorrow. The Bible says now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Tonight is your night. Some people think they can just keep putting this off and putting this off. And one day my fear is your heart will get so hard you won't even hear God speak to you anymore. You know, there's another city in the Bible that God judged. They're known as Sodom and Gomorrah. There was no warning for them. There was no Jonah barfed out of a whale walking through their streets because they had gone beyond the point of no return. There was still hope for Nineveh. There's still hope for you. Be careful, there is a point of no return where you can go too far. Jesus said it's the unforgivable sin the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that you reject the work the Holy Spirit has come to do, which is to make you aware of your need for Jesus. You say no to Him, and your heart can become irreparably hardened. The Bible says, he who is often reproved hardens his heart, and it will be cut off, and that without remedy. Listen, the Holy Spirit is working on you. Some of you are saying, you know what, Greg, I know I need Jesus. I know I'm a sinner. I know he'll forgive me. I believe it's all true, but I still want to party or I still want to have sex with my girlfriend or I still want to do drugs and drink and I still want to lie and cheat and steal. Listen, to know this is true and not act on it, that's super scary because you could miss this opportunity to get right with God and then you'll be separated from Him for all eternity. Friend, there is a heaven for those that put their faith in Jesus and there is a hell for those that reject Him. Well, how could a God of love send someone to hell? Listen, God doesn't send people to hell. You effectively send yourself there by rejecting God's only offer of forgiveness through Christ. God doesn't want you to go there. He wants you in heaven. Your eternal destiny hinges on your decision. You're gonna either say yes or no to Jesus right now. We're gonna pray. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to make this commitment or recommitment to Christ. If you haven't done it yet, please do it tonight. I promise you, you will never regret it. Let's all pray, Father. This is your word. It's good news if we listen. I pray for those that do not yet know you yet. I pray that your Holy Spirit will convince them of their need for Jesus. I pray that they'll see their sin and see the Savior and that they will come to you tonight and be forgiven. And I pray for prodigal sons and daughters, Lord, that have 
been running from you. Help them to come back home tonight as you throw your arms around them and you say, welcome home son, welcome home daughter. Help them to come, we pray. And we ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen.